Hello, AP Environmental Science students. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I want to wish you first a happy new year 2021 um, and show us where we're at. So right now I'm going to be introducing unit five, which has to do with land and water use. You can see uh, in terms of exam weight, it's about 10 to 15 percent. Um, and this is the unit we're going to cover uh, to take us all the way through to the end of the semester. All right, so first off, what are some things we're going to be looking at in this unit? You can see um, a couple topics are familiar to you. Um, tragedy of the Commons, which I'm going to talk about today, um, and ecological footprint. Um, we're going to come back to that at the end. Um, we, we touched upon that in our unit zero, if you remember the beginning of the year. Um, you calculated your ecological footprint. Today, um, what I'm going to be doing is talking about three things here, the tragedy of the commons, clear cutting, and the green revolution. You can see we're going to be explaining environmental concepts, describing environmental concepts and processes, and looking at the author's perspective and assumptions. Um, if you're interested in learning more um, from unit uh, five, I have um, added some things to Google, or sorry, AP Classroom. Um, you can watch topic videos. Um, you can look at some more practice questions. I saw from the sur your survey that some folks were interested in doing a little bit more prep. So that's what the tool I'm going to be using. Um, and I'm going to, I can give you feedback on your practice questions. Um, in terms of assessments for this unit, there are two things. And again, this is based on feedback from your survey. Thank you for doing that. Um, you're going to be assessing your knowledge in two ways. One is a kind of project-based uh, sustainable menu, which is on Google Classroom right now. You can take a look at it. Um, and the second one is two FRQ questions, um, which will be Tuesday, January 19th. And mostly it'll be covering unit five. Um, there might be some recall of some concepts from the earlier units. Mainly I'm going to be focusing on unit five for your semester final. Okay, so first thing I'd like you to do is look at this map. So this map represents uh, use of land throughout the United States. Um, and you can see by different categories. Um, and the relative area of each of those categories. So what, what I'd like you to do now is tell me what is one thing that surprises you about this map and what is a question you have about this data? So you, you pick which one, uh, which uh, land use um, you are surprised about um, and give me a question about it. All right, so the first thing topic today we're going to talk about 5.1 has to do with the tragedy of the commons. And here you can see some goats out in a field. So what is uh, the concept we're going to be looking at, tragedy of the commons? Um, you should be able to explain this concept and this process. And know when it occurs and also know some examples and ways of addressing it. So tragedy of the commons is uh, when individuals use a shared public resource in their own self-interest, oftentimes degrading them. So it must be a public resource, meaning owned by um, a government agency or it's public land, um, and it must be degraded, overused, depleted, um, used up in some way. So some examples, uh, the most the classic one is overgrazing. So um, this was based on a paper written by a um, early 1800s, uh, I think it was an economist, Hardin, um, who looked at the commons that were in um, New England, where people could bring in their cows and commonly use them uh, to have their cows graze. And lo and behold, everyone brought their cows. Everyone used that land and to the point where it became exhausted. So overgrazing still happens. That way, overfishing, our ocean resources are public. Uh, no one owns the ocean. Water and air pollution. So this is taking it to a different level, talking about things like the watersheds and the the air shed um, that's out there. And uh, polluting that um, is another example of tragedy of the commons because no one owns those large bodies of water and the air. Um, overuse of groundwater. Groundwater is also publicly accessible, though you need some rights uh, to draw water. 
um, the, the actual aquifer is not owned by people. So um, those are the uh, some examples that you should be familiar with. Uh, why does it happen? Well, when no one owns a, a resource, um, no one directly suffers the negative consequences um, of degrading it or overusing it. So there's nothing, they, they, they don't suffer or have to pay any consequence for overusing it. Uh, people assume, assume also that if they don't overuse it, someone else will. Um, so it's if it's not me, then it's someone else. Usually that's a common mentality. Here's an example. Well, there it is, the last fish in the ocean. Woohoo! At least we beat the Russians and the Spaniards to it. So that's a classic example of overfishing um, as a tragedy of the commons. There's no penalty for overusing or degrading. So that's another big concept of why it happens for those public resources. So here's garbage being dumped into a river as well. Um, and that's just flowing down the river and no one paying that uh, consequence. This truck driver, or whoever owns the operation of this trash disposal is not paying the consequence of that going down the river, uh, affecting other people's water quality. Um, so the problem um, can lead to things like this, uh, the clap, clap, sorry, the collapse of the Atlantic cod fisheries. Um, and you can see over time that fisheries of the, the cod, which is a delicious fish, by the way, um, and it was harvested in the 1800s, uh, early 1900s in a way that was probably uh, fairly sustainable, uh, mainly having to do with technology. Technology of fish fishing really changed in the 1960s um, and the number of people catching fish increased. Um, and you can see that the harvest went way up and then there was a dramatic crash. So overfishing is an example of tragedy of the commons. Air pollution, so uh, if there are coal burning uh, plants um, and uh, industries, industry is making money, the power generating companies are making money, um, they are um, not paying the consequence of that air quality directly. Um, it's rather other people that might have problems with asthma or bronchitis. Another example, pesticides. So we're using pesticides on your fields and then that contaminating the groundwater. Um, what we're talking about here is a term called externalities. An externality is any negative cost associated with the human action that aren't accounted for in the price. So it's an unattended side effect of that activity or that use of the of land. So externality, that's a term you need to be familiar with. All right, so here is ways we can deal with tragedy of the commons. One would be to privatize all land. So people, uh, in, uh, individuals uh, own that land and there's no, uh, they're directly accountable for that land. If it degrades, uh, they are suffering the consequence of it. Another way is fat, uh, fees and taxes um, would be permit system for grazing and logging, which do, do exist in places like the National Forest Service or Bureau of Land Management. Um, also, taxes, fines, criminal charges uh, for pollution or sharing uh, shared oil, soil, water resources. So, examples of those laws would be things like Clean Air Act in the 1970s, uh, Clean Water Act, 1972, Safe Drinking Act. All these are ways we can make people accountable. Um, for pollution. So these mainly were established in the early 70s and they've been modified um, since that time. Bureau of Land Management is also an important entity which manages graze lands in the Western United States. And like I said, they collect fees for grazing um, and they regulate it. So you need a regulating agency essentially to avoid tragedy of the commons. All right. Now it's practice FRQ time. What I'd like you to do is identify uh, the ocean of the world are first, or the, are the oceans of the world are often referred to as a commons. What I'd like you to do is identify one other such common, explain how human activities affect that commons and propose a solution for managing a commons. Good luck.
So one of the things you should have noticed by looking at that map at the beginning was a vast amount of land that's used for timber. Uh, so timber is the harvest of trees for um, products. They include all kinds of wood products, furniture, construction, you know, paper in some cases. Um, and you can see that most of those are out in the western uh, part of the United States, so they represented out west part of the, of the United States. Um, you can see there's privately owned land. There's also federal land. That's U.S. Forest Service mainly. Um, I had an opportunity to work for the U.S. Forest Ser Service for six years in fisheries and wildlife up in Northern California. Um, you can see there's also corporate timber land, so not owned by individuals, but by large corporation. Fair Hauser might be one you're familiar with. That's a particular uh, corporation that owns lots of land. So what are the what's the problem with how we do forest um, management? Well, one of the big uh, problems we're dealing with is clear cutting. So clear cutting um, is 5.2, and I'm going to be talking about that. So essential knowledge, um, you're going to need to uh, describe what clear cutting is, this environmental concept, and some of the things, the consequences uh, to the earth um, and uh, to the environment of that clear cutting. Um, so direct effects of clear cutting. First of all, I just wanna say that there are times when clear cutting is appropriate. Uh, for example, in Wisconsin, we have uh, managed stands of different species like uh, red pines and other things. And th the big difference is those are not virgin forests. So those are forests that have been raised, kind of like Christmas trees, um, grown um, for that sole purpose, and that land was cleared a long time ago um, of the old growth. When we're talking mainly about clear cutting as a problem, we're mainly dealing with old growth forests, which are usually out in the west part of the United States. So I just want you to know that. So what happens to clear, in clear cutting is first there's going to be soil erosion. You, you're going to remove the loss of that of that root structure as that tree uh, that stump rots. Um, you're going to remove organic matter, nutrients from the forest. Um, it also deposits uh, sediment as that erosion happens into streams. My work was in fisheries, um, and our big part of my job was to look at where they were doing timber harvest um, and how could that timber harvest happen in such a way that it didn't cause lots of sedimentation uh, into uh, streams and rivers, which supported wild salmon populations. Um, and oftentimes there are very unpopular decisions that we made uh, of regulating how uh, forests were managed. So here's an example of clear cutting. If you haven't seen one, maybe you've been in a plain and you look down if you've been out in the west part of the United States. There's a watershed you can really see kind of how, or road, um, and those roads also contribute to that erosion, um, creating an exposed surface. Um, so, Big distinction I want you to know is there are ways of managing forests. We're gonna be talking about selective cutting later um, and how that happens and also ways of protecting those watersheds. You can see there's a buffer there. So increased uh, soil erosion and stream temperature. Once that soil gets in the water, we talked about albedo earlier. Um, so that water's gonna be darker. It's gonna have less albedo. It's gonna absorb light rather than reflect it and it's gonna cause increased temperatures. Um, obviously, the trees protect the streams and rivers, and they're no longer there, so it's going to heat up. Um, you can also get flooding and landslides. Uh, that machinery is going to compact that soil, uh, increase sunlight, dries it out. We talked about the, the root structures, um, oftentimes losing that very valuable old horizon when that erosion happens, um, and less water retention in the soil. So. Uh, those are some of the, oh, there's a picture of the landslide here. I think this was, uh, I don't remember where it was, maybe Washington. You can see just all that erosion happening down in that city. Um, so tree plantations, um, they're usually what happens when you clear cut, you're going to plant a bunch of species, I'm sorry, one species uh, in that area, maybe two um, and so as a consequence, you're going to have a lot lower biodiversity um, in that area. Less species diversity means less resilience for that ecosystem. Um, and there's going to obviously be less habitats and niches for lots of species to exist. Um, 
all those plants are going to be the same age also um, that increases the structural and uh, it mon homogenizes the structure of the forest so it's not going to have different sized trees um, that are utilized by species differently think of things like woodpeckers which really like those dead old trees those standing trees um, and without those uh, can't exist um, so what are some benefits of forests? Why do we care about um, our forests? Well, we know they do some very valuable ecological services. One of them is they remove um, via their stomata, which are these little holes, little holes inside um, the bottom part of a leaf, for example. And they absorb um, some of the excess new, uh, pollutants in the air, Th things like all organic compounds. We're going to be talking about those later and when we talk about air pollution, nitric oxides, particulate matter, um, which are some very small particles that uh, can cause lots of problems. Um, it removes carbon. So trees take in carbon dioxide, they convert that carbon dioxide into sugars, um, and they produce wood with that carbon. So it's a huge service. So that absorption of carbon dioxide and storage of carbon in service of, of those trees. Also, uh, trees are very valuable because they have lots of biodiversity um, and they're utilized for ecotourism. All right, so what are some consequences of deforestation? Well, it reduces the air filtering and carbon storage surface services. Um, those trees, when they're cut down, um, are releasing that carbon dioxide in, back in the atmosphere. Um, another practice, which is part of this in tropical regions, and may, this is not the United States, we're talking South America uh, and Africa and a few other places in Asia, they utilize a method called slash and burn, which essentially means you're cutting the uh, forest down and you're burning it and then you're doing agriculture on that land. What does that do? That's going to release a lot of carbon dioxide and nitri nitrogen oxides um, and water vapor into the atmosphere. And that can contribute to greenhouse gases, uh, or that is greenhouse gases, causing more climate change. Um, slash and burn agriculture is pretty co common practice. Um, it's something that I worked in uh, when I was in Peace Corps in South America, is trying to address other ways farmers can produce crops and actually integrating forestry practices um, into their agricultural practices called agroforestry so they can maximize um, the, the services of those forests and make money long term. Okay, your turn here. Describe two ecosystem services provided for humans by forest and explain how clear cutting would affect each ecosystem service you describe and make sure that you're speaking for the trees. Okay, another thing you should have saw when you looked at uh, this map of land use was how much land we're using to produce food. Uh, we've got cow and pasture range, land for animals, livestock feed, so just the amount of land that we need to feed our animals, uh, food we eat. So all these things have to do with food production. That's the next Topic we're going to be looking at green revolution so 5.3 um, we're going to be looking at sorry we're going to be looking at a lot of ways that we have produced food um, in vast uh, quantities in recent time our objective and skills for this is you can see we're looking to describe the changes in agricultural practices which hap happened in the United States really um, made us produce a lot of food um, in a much more efficient way, but also we are using a lot more land, obviously, to produce food as well. Um, so the Green Revolution is a shift, and we're going to be talking about that shift. What are some of the negatives and some topics that still haven't been figured out? Are they negative or positive? So we're going to be looking at that as well. Um, first thing I want to have you look at here is a graph that shows what is the Malthusian theory. Um, Malthus was a reverend in the late 1700s who postulated that 
human population would grow beyond uh, the carrying capacity of the earth in terms of food production specifically. But if we, we continue to grow that, at that rate of population growth, which did happen, and there'd be this point of crisis, would there be this huge uh, die off of people because of starvation? Well, it didn't happen. Um, not the way Malthus uh, hypothesized. And a lot of that has to do with the Green Revolution. So what is it? Um, it's a shift in agriculture from away from small family operated farms to large industrialized agro business. I know some of you were able to watch the uh, Kiss, uh, Kiss the Ground, uh, Kiss the Earth, Kiss the Ground movie. Um, and you uh, got an idea of what industrialized agriculture is in, in terms of soils specifically. Um, well, it's increase in mechanization, uh, utilizing uh, more genetically modified organisms, uh, large scale irrigation, uh, synthetic uh, fertilizers and pesticide use. Um, it increased the efficiency of lands um, and the short term profitability. So farmers started to make more money and obviously increasing the food supply. Um, it decreased world hunger, so it helped avoid that Malthusian crisis um, and increased the Earth's carrying capacity for humans. So we are, you know, currently, you know, reaching, reaching up to, you know, 8 billion people on this planet. Um, and we are, we do have people that starve, uh, but not at the levels that we were hypothesizing earlier. Um, it has negative consequences. Um, you already know about soils and soil erosion, loss of biodiversity. Um, there's also lots of groundwater sur and surface water contamination that happens through uh, these agricultural practices. Um, paramount to this system is mechanization. So using tractors and plowing to till fields um, and combine for harvests. So making more efficient machines to harvest Increase our reliance on fossil fuels, gasoline and diesel fuel emits a lot of greenhouse gases and contributes to climate change. Heavy machinery can also compact the soil, increase the water capacity, and de be detrimental to the topsoil. Um, high, another big uh, component of the Green Revolution is looking at modifying organisms. So. First uh, thing that we started to do is hybridize uh, organisms and create what are called high yield varieties. So taking two desirable traits to, from two different plants, combining them together through just uh, selective breeding. And we created these hybrids um, or parent plants with those ideal traits. Um, it increased food st stability in, where, uh, in places like India and Pakistan and Mexico that really had instability and were able to increase their populations. Um, genetically modified is a different uh, system of creating high yield varieties, and that's using the genes of other species typically uh, and putting them into the genome of that species. Okay, I'm going to talk about a few examples here. So here is a hybrid um, sequence. You can see um, it's combining two individuals, crossing them to create one individual that has both desired traits. Genetically modified, we're taking a gene from a species, another species typically, uh, and inserting it into the genome of uh, a crop. And then we've got a genetically modified organism, uh, agrobacterium. So it's both plant, in this case, and bacteria. Gene, it was where the gene came from, um, and it created a disease-resistant plant. Um, so genetically modified, just to touch on that, uh, our organism, again, uh, genetically modified crops, which have dream, uh, traits, uh, genes, um, for things like drought resistance, pest resistance, faster growth, uh, larger fruit grain. Um, it increases the profitability um, because those plants tend to have less loss because they're resistant to things like drought and pests. Um, they tend to have larger size as well and increased yield per acre. Um, one of the classic examples is the BT corn. So this is a corn that uh, had the uh, a gene 
from Bacillus thuringiensis, um, which is a bacterium inserted in it, which produces a chemical which repels insects um, and it repels pests. So you can see this one is with the Bt corn and this one does not have the Bt corn. Um, so this is a classic example of genetically modified species. Um, the uh, negative you might be thinking about um, is that they're all genetically identif identical. So if something does happen to this type of individual that has this Bt corn, all those are going to be success, uh, susceptible to that disease or pest, unless it gets modified again. Um, synthetic fertilizers. So what is that? That's producing fertilizers. Um, we talked about uh, nutrient cycle, um, and we talked about nitrogen and phosphorus and how those are um, extracted um, and produced. So we are going away from using manure and compost to using man-made uh, fertilizers. What does this do? Um, it really helps you dial in exactly the nutrient content um, for those crops. So the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium add to the soil. Uh, it has a big negative, however, that that excess nitrate and phosphate can end up into fields, water, waterways like the Yahara River um, and our Yahara Lakes, where it can cause algae blooms and eutrophication. Um, it requires lots of manufacturing. So releasing CO2 is all the mechanization uh, and the amount of machinery needed to do, produce it. Um, next topic, irrigation. So how do we grow food uh, in dry areas like California? Well, it requires irrigation system. So usually it's drawing water from the ground um, and pulling that up and then distributing it on the land. Um, it makes agriculture happen in all kinds of places, but California is a classic example. Uh, Salinas Valley, um, that area would not be producing the lettuce that it produces if it wasn't for irrigation. Um, it can compl uh, completely draw down that aquifer, so pull so much water, um, it can actually cause the whole land to shift down um, and have negative impact. Um, Overwatering, if it's not managed properly, can cause um, problems with the root structures of plants where they're not able to get oxygen. oxygen. Um, and it can also cause salinization. So as waters, water brings uh, minerals with it, oftentimes water has small traces of minerals and salt, and then it evaporates. It's leaving behind those salts in the soil, and over time, eventually that soil can become uh, saline can become salty and unusable. Um, another big negative is uh, pesticides. So this looks like soybean field that's being sprayed. Um, it's increased the use of pest synthetic chemicals sprayed on fields to kill weeds, insects, rodents, and other pests that eat or damage crops. Um, it usually cause, uh, increases the yield because those um, Obviously, you're eliminating your pests, so you're going to get more production from that area. Um, negatives, uh, you can wash off um, that pesticide's going to wash off in a rainfall event, getting to, into the water species, into the water, into the soil. It can have negative impact on other species in that area, especially bees. There's a chemical called neonicotinoids, which are, is an uh, herbicide. And that has been known to cause all kinds of problems uh, for different bee populations. Um, also, um, we know examples, uh, the DDT. Um, so DDT was a commonly used insecticide and it uh, biomagnified up into birds, especially pred predatory birds like eagles, made their eggs very thin um, and caused decline. Atrazine is another herbicide that's used um, commonly in the United States, and there's lots of research from Tyrone Hayes and others that it's turning uh, hermaphrodizing um, amphibians. So it's disrupting the hormones of those species. It's also been found to happen in fish. Um, just another quick note, when you combine things, a classic example is um, 
Roundup Ready soybean. So here's a soy plant again. Um, you can make um, soybean uh, resistant using genetically modified uh, process and taking a gene and putting in the plant to make it resistant to Roundup, which is a commonly used herbicide, which kills all plants typically. Um, but the soybean will be resistant to it. So what you can do is spray the heck out of it, right, with herbicides um, and Roundup and the soybean does not die. The negative of that is eliminating a lot of uh, biodiversity of any other uh, plants that might be in the area, and it promotes a lot of use of herbicides. So combining a genetically modified issue with this issue of having to do with pesticides. All right, your turn, 5.3. What I'd like you to do is describe one environmental advantage and one uh, environmental disadvantage of using a genetically modified 